Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vince Bonham. I'm the senior advisor to the director of NHGRI for Genomics and Health Disparities, and I'm pleased to welcome you here this afternoon. Um, this is a unique lecture today because it's a collaboration between the intramural research program of NHGRI and the Genomics and Health Disparities Lecture Series. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for the two groups to come together to have an opportunity for you to, to hear from our speaker today. Uh, the Genomics and Health Disparities Lecture Series is sponsored by NHLBI, NIDDK, NHGRI, and the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and the Office of Minority Health for the FDA. It's an opportunity to bring different parts of the federal agencies who are interested in genomics and health disparities together to bring speakers to NIH to explore issues from the perspective of how genomics can play an important role in understanding health disparities and health equity issues. I'm pleased that this afternoon that my colleague, uh, Dr. Nigel Crawford, is going to introduce our speaker, uh, and we look forward to our talk this afternoon from Dr. Opala. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ben said, my name's Nigel Crawford. I'm a tenure track investigator in the DIR side of the um, of this equation. So it's my really great honor to be able to introduce Dr. Fumi Olapadi to uh, be give, giving this joint seminar today. Um, Dr. Olapadi is the uh, Walter L. Palmer Distinguished Service Professor in Medicine and Human Genetics, the Associate Dean of Global Health, and the director of the Center for Clinical Cancer Genetics at the University of Chicago School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Olapadi went to medical school at the University of I Ibadan in Nigeria. Subsequently, she came over to the US to do a fellowship, uh, sorry, a residency in the um, Cook County Hospital in Chicago. And following this, she went on to do a fellowship in the University of Chicago. Dr. Olapadi is really very much a, an international leader in uh, cancer genetics. She's an expert in uh, cancer risk assessment and developing individualized uh, treatments for uh, both breast and ovarian cancer. Her work very much focuses on identifying patients that are at risk of the most aggressive forms of these diseases and then implementing novel management strategies um, based on individual genetic assessments in, in these populations to perform early interventions and essentially reduce mortality in these high-risk groups. She approaches the study of aggressive cancers in a, using a number of different approaches. Um, she's very interested in the mechanisms of familial cancer, um, the mechanisms of uh, tumor progression in high-risk individuals, and very importantly, uh, genetic and epigenetic factors contributing to disparities in cancer outcomes in diverse populations. I really think that the, the power of Dr. Olapadi's work and her contribution to the field is, is well highlighted by her work with um, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, where she's shown distinctively that these two genes increase incidence of uh, breast cancer uh, and cancer outcomes in Af women of African descent. Overall, her lab uses highly innovative uh, and develops innovative approaches to studying aggressive forms of cancer. She, for example, she uses whole genome technologies uh, to reduce global disparities and help in um, cancer outcomes. She's been the recipient of numerous awards throughout her career. Um, I can only list a, f a few of them here, but some of the highlights would be uh, the MacArthur Foundation Genius Fellowship, the Doris Duke uh, Distinguished Clinical Scientist and Exceptional Ment Mentor Award. And she's also been elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, Dr. Olapadi, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce you, and we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you.
we've done. And knowing that this is a really mixed audience, I tried really hard to just give you snippets of how we're thinking about breast cancer genomics and health disparities. And um, you know, the bottom line of what I really want to emphasize at the end of at the conclusion of my uh, work, my lecture today is that we really have a, a, a unique opportunity in precision medicine to get rid of black-white differences and begin to really talk about getting care to individuals at the personal level. And to get to that, we all have to work together collaboratively. I know that this lecture has been sponsored by Office of Minority Health, but really when you talk about individual and personalized medicine, we're all in the minority because it's one genome at a time, it's one drug at a time, one person at a time that we have to take care of as physicians. So I just want to share my journey to trying to get precision medicine for all. And it's really because I came to this country to study cardiovascular medicine, and I quickly gave up on that dream to become an oncologist. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that I was really inspired by what I was seeing in cancer at that time uh, when we were really doing subset analysis of different chromosome changes in leukemia and, lymph and lymphoma. And uh, we were cloning one gene at a time. And Jenna Rowley and Francis Collins and all the giants in, in uh, human genetics at the time said, why don't we just do the Human Genome Project and just map every gene, clone every gene. And then once we have that, then we can really begin to think about um, risk assessment and best therapies. And in the 80s, that was really a, a broad vision. And it materialized. And now we're past that. And so the question is, how do we actually get to getting the genetic information that will allow us to do the best risk assessment and provide the best therapies so that we can, in, in fact, eliminate health disparities and improve health equity. And so, you know, I started in lymphoma leukemia, and I still think that, you know, there's just really uh, arbitrary uh, division of these different types of cancers, that if we really begin to think about pathways and think about how we treat uh, individual diseases, we may find that there's actually more commonality among all these different types of cancers. Having said that, I think the reason why the Office of Minority Health and uh, Center to Reduce Disparities really want me to give this lecture is because when you talk about incidence rate, and ever since uh, you know, people have been giving um, I've been talking about data. It's always been that you have more uh, breast cancer among African Americans, and um, you know, even though the incidence now has approached the incidence in blacks, the mortality is really what is so disturbingly um, much higher among African Americans. And as we began to think about how people are diagnosed and what we've done with population screening. We now actually are having a debate in the breast cancer community about overdiagnosis of breast cancer. How many of you have heard about the debate about overdiagnosis and overtreatment? Raise your hands. Okay, so that's been talked about a lot. But what's actually not been in the public uh, press is the fact that there are many people who still get diagnosed with regional and distant metastasis at the time of diagnosis, despite the fact that we've done large-scale population screening over the last 30 years. So the question is, who are these individuals? Well, we began to sort of break it down the minute we started th talking about you know, different types of breast cancer. And the fact that homoreceptor positive, HO2 negative breast cancer is the the most common type of breast cancer, and it's the one that's been studied the most. It's still also what kills m most women who develop breast cancer. The reason why we've all been very excited about triple negative breast cancer is because we don't have a target for it. And as oncologists and cancer researchers, a lot of our effort is being focused on finding new treatments 
for diseases and less of prevention. When I came to this country, I, the whole mantra in our medical school was that prevention was better than cure because you have low resources. And if you have low resources, you have to really prevent diseases, keep people healthy, instead of spending a lot of money to treat diseases. So it was really surprising to me that at County Hospital when I started, all we did was treat people who came into the hospital, and there was not really a lot of public health uh, uh, work being done in Chicago. So, but now we know better. We know that when you actually collect data, that you now see that African Americans are more likely to get triple negative breast cancer. It wasn't always the case that we knew that. We only knew that because uh, my good friend, uh, Jeff Trent, uh, when he was at NAGRI, uh, really thought he should do gene expression profiling. There was a new technology, and he applied it to very a few uh, number of pa uh, patients. Didn't have a lot of tumors to look at, but with, I think it was maybe seven or eight, you know, BRCA1 associated breast cancers, BRCA2 associated breast cancer and sporadic breast cancer, he actually was able to tell us that your germline genetics actually could determine the type of tumor you had. This was profound at the time, and of course, the, um, the uh, Stanford group and everyone sort of really began to see that your germline genetics determines the kind of tumor you had. And when this paper was published in the New England Journal, our lab read it, and you know, as a good oncologist, what I said was, well, they, it really wasn't the BRCA1 signature that they were talking about. We wrote a letter to the editor that what they probably did was, these were all ER negative tumors. These are all ER negative, these are all ER positive. Majority of sporadic breast tumors are ER positive. So what they are really describing is a, 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 a signature of ER negative tumor and not necessarily a signature of BRCA1 because that was the level of understanding we had at the time. However, with subsequent work, with our work, a lot of work of the Breast Cancer Linkage Consortium, it became clear that, in fact, BRCA1 patients actually develop a, a disease that was a well-defined phenotype. They tended to have a medullary or atypical medullary, very high mitotic rate. And one of the things that sort of struck me was the fact that they had high proliferation fraction. And if you're coming in as a lymphoma doctor or a leukemia doctor, you know that when patients come in with a high tumor burden that, and you know, with my internship at uh, University of Ibadan, if you had a patient with Bucket's lymphoma who came in with large jaw masses, big abdominal tumors, our job at that time was to make sure we treated them immediately and with that little red uh, uh, drug called adriamycin, these tumors will just melt away over the weekend. We didn't even care about tumor lysis at the time because these were usually young children, but the tumors went away. And I was really fascinated why these big tumors melted away, but when we talk about breast cancer, these tumors that were growing fast, we were still really thinking about cutting them off, doing surgery, and a lot of things. Anyway, cut a long story short, we then realized that these tumors, of course, had the worst outcomes, and African Americans tended to have tumors that were sort of described like this, and also had the worst outcomes. And that's what really got us thinking about, can we do a, 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 cheap, a, a cheaper version of gene expression profiling? Now, this is a very good pathology uh, uh, and morphology of breast cancer. If you think about global health, most people will not be able to do pathology of breast cancer like this in most parts of the world. And so most patients that are treated with breast cancer don't have appropriate diagnosis of their breast cancer. And as a result of that, they will not have appropriate therapy of their breast cancer. It doesn't matter where they live. If you cannot get a good diagnosis, you cannot get the best treatment. So we know that estrogen receptor is the first drug able target. It was identified at the University of Chicago. Charlie Hoggins did a very simple experiment, took uh, the ovaries of women with metastatic disease, and if they were premenopausal and they had oophorectomy, the tumor melted away because you had massive apoptosis and you starved them of estrogen, and these women did well. 
okay? That's a treatment that actually works. It's very effective for any woman with ER estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Along the way came another target for therapy in breast cancer, which is Hortune uh, uh, positive breast cancer. Dennis Lehman really was also a, a student and resident at University of Chicago and thought if we could just target HER2, we're going to be able to treat a lot more aggressive breast cancer. So these two uh, 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 targets is really why every woman with breast cancer wants to know is it ER positive or HER2 positive. Because we know that if you treat women appropriately, they're going to, if they don't survive their breast cancer, they're going to live very long lives. When we were transplanting patients with HER2 positive breast cancer, they didn't respond any better than when we didn't do bone marrow transplant. However, the minute we got HER2 targeted therapy, a lot of women who would have died within two years of breast cancer became long-term survivors because of the target. So fast forward, we then said, let's go and look at the patterns of breast cancer in Nigeria. And this is the last time I will show this slide because when, I, when we first did the experiment, we didn't believe that, in fact, the pattern in Nigeria, Senegal, and among African ancestry could be so different from what has been reported in Japanese and white women in Europe. So anytime I talk about disparities, the thing that I always like to say is that the real gap is really the knowledge disparities, right? If you don't do the research, you're going to go come to the wrong conclusion. And so Office of Minority Health, whatever the NIH is ad addresses, we've just got to just do the best science. It doesn't matter where. And the best science will give us revelations of what we should be doing, because we can't assume that we know everything about breast cancer. But that was what we, we, we found. And then once we did publish the paper, there was all sorts of disagreement about the fact that the way we you know, did the analysis, the tumors were you know, in the fridge too long, and it couldn't be possible. And then subsequently, uh, others in Africa and North and East Africa, everybody started looking to say, OK, what's the estrogen receptor status of our tumors? Because now we can do this research. And you know, number of studies, I was, I mean, when we did this summary uh, prior to the aortic meeting in Morocco, I was really impressed that 30 studies in Egypt, Sudan, uh, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, 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 Ghana, Mali, Nigeria, everyone trying to figure out what is the type of breast cancer that we find. And what we find is that there's really, a, you know, the data are all over the place from in, uh, in northeastern um, region having 63% uh, that were ER positive to studies in West Africa showing 35% that were ER positive and South Africa showing 60% ER positive. I show this slide just to give you the, 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 the impression that, in fact, if you look at African Americans, 64% in the U.S., and you look at U.S., Sierra Caucasians, 80% are ER positive, there's definitely heterogeneity in who is showing up and what type of breast cancer they have. And that's why we can't say one size fits all, that we're going to have a population approach that treats breast cancer the same way, no matter where they are. And this is really important because when I do my practice, uh, and I have the benefit of being a doctor, I see different types of patients. And they come in different shapes and sizes and colors. And this is a 64-year-old white woman with interval triple negative breast cancer. Based on population data, this woman should get a mammogram every other year. Okay, and she went predictably March 03 and March 05. The only, she was only two days late in terms of two years to the time. And yet, her breast cancer was so aggressive, so highly proliferative, she only lived one year and didn't respond to any treatment we gave her. Okay, when you read the literature, you will think this only happens to black women who are poor and have no access to care. That's not true. So now the US Supreme Court and a lot of things that really have 
opened up how we approach and what we do can be interpreted however we want it. So it says, you know, it takes 1,900 mammograms of women in their 40s to save one life, but only 1,300 of women in their 50s. It's more cost effective. So just wait till you are 50 and stop calling us the death panel, right? That's been some of the things that's been argued as we try to address the Affordable Care Act and what's covered, what's not covered, who should have access, when should we rationalize health. And I, I actually, you know, anytime you're thinking about any public health intervention, we always want to do cost effectiveness analysis. And sometimes that cost effectiveness analysis doesn't get us to the personal level where people, in fact, really want to have information about when should I get mammogram? How should I get mammogram? Is it going to help me survive breast cancer or not? So to move forward, I think that we're actually now post the mammogram stage. And I, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a, a, a nice walk that we now do in Hyde Park with one of my African-American patients who decided that we should, uh, you know, her, her, her mantra is beyond mammography. And she's trying to do a walk to let African-American women be aware of the fact that because you have had a mammogram doesn't mean that you're home free. So this is a very uh, important 45-year-old um, uh, woman who had a perfectly normal mammogram, even at the time that she felt a lump in her breast. And because she was savvy and because she knew what to do, in fact, because she was aware of her cancer risk because of her family history, she didn't stop there. She went, she got an ultrasound, and she got a mammo, uh, an MRI, and here's this very tiny uh, triple negative breast cancer. Okay, some of the th uh, things, uh, uh, stories I hear when I go on this walk with women on the south side of Chicago is the fact that they will show up to a doctor with a lump, and they will say, "Well, you're too young to have breast cancer," and so it doesn't get uh, evaluated. Or, well, you know, maybe, it, maybe it's a boil. When we're in, in Nigeria, they will show up at the primary health center, and these women have just started, you know, maybe they're lactating, maybe they have just uh, uh, had a child, and somebody will tell them, well, you know, it's not breast cancer because you're too young to have breast cancer. Well, the data are such that women of African ancestry tend to get breast cancer at a much younger age, both here and throughout the diaspora. And many of them will get breast cancer at the time that they're also lactating and having babies. And that's some of the epidemiology data that our, day, our work in Nigeria has shown. And so very often, these young women are misdiagnosed or not sent for appropriate diagnosis. However, if you are flat-chested, you are not really endowed with a size D cup, you might be, it might be a lot easier for you to actually feel that lump. And a lot of women do not have the luxury of being small-breasted and being able to feel a lump at the time when it's this tiny and it's picked up by both an MRI and an ultrasound. So the question is, what is the value of treating anybody to do breast exam? What is the value of telling anyone to get mammogram when it doesn't work 30% of the time. So all our public health interventions actually will fail women who develop aggressive triple negative breast cancer. So then what are we going to do about it? So my view of the world is why not just sequence everyone's genome, right? If we knew who was going to get that type of breast cancer and we knew it by age 30, then maybe we can actually begin to personalize care. How did I come to that conclusion? Came to the conclusion because we actually know that there are some high penetrant uh, mutations in genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 that predictively, they're very rare, but they will cause breast cancer at an early stage. And because BRCA1 is part of the, that uh, 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 gene, uh, pool, we've been really doing a lot of work trying to understand how BRCA1 and BRCA2 and some of these genes contribute to the early onset, the rare alleles 
the pathogenic, if you inherit them, either one, uh, 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 through your father's side or your mother's side, you're predictably going to get early onset breast cancer. And then, of course, you have your um, uh, ATM and other genes that now we have the ability to test for that are, have, they're not that rare, but they contribute to increased breast cancer risk. And then a lot of people have done genome-wide association studies trying to look at common alleles that are going to be distributed in, in such a way that they may contribute to uh, cancer risk. So this is a good model for us to think about in terms of population risk stratification, right? We started doing this work by looking for families, and families are rare. If you are working in a place where people don't even have a, know what a diagnosis of cancer is, people are going to show up not even knowing what their mother died for or what other diseases are in their family. Uh, if you are only you know, focused on family-based uh, ascertainment, people are adopted. There's so many reasons why people may not know their family history. And yet, when pe these genes have been tested for, majority of 60% of women who at the time of cancer diagnosis uh, identified to have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation do not record a family history of breast or ovarian cancer. So how do we pick those women up? So the question then is, you know, we, we, we ask that question in my clinic because we have, you know, um, I, we've had a, 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 a tumor bank, African Americans coming in and, or, you know, we've had data from European women, everyone who's really done linkage studies and who's done, who has case control studies, they've all been able to use next generation sequencing to look at the estimates of patients who are in their cohorts who develop breast cancer and have mutations in one of these genes. So we collaborated with Mary Claire King and we said, okay, let's just look at 289 um, African Americans from the south side of Chicago that either I or my colleagues at the University of Chicago uh, saw. And well over 80% uh, 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 of, 22% uh, um, um, uh, of them have mutations in one of these genes that actually confer a high risk of breast cancer, okay? So clearly, this is not the end of this story because we only picked the ones that are definitely deleterious, pathogenic, and so when we take it from having breast cancer as an ascertainment, one in five have a deleterious mutation. Then we did a study in Nigeria where um, that study has been in the field since 2002, and we also wanted to know what is the burden of mutations in these genes in this relatively young cohort of women in Nigeria coming in to have their breast cancer diagnosed. And you can see lots more variations, lots more genes that are in the DNA repair pathways, but the predominant genes causing breast cancer is still BRCA1 and BRCA2. And these are consecutive cases. And when we look at what's the, you know, are this, you know, they, 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 are they found out mutations? Of course not. Each one has their own personal mutation, right? And the mutations are in this large gene, 1863 amino acids, all across the gene. So there was no, you know, initially we thought, let's do a quick strategy like we can do in uh, women of uh, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, where Three founder mutations explained all of their, their cancers. And for African genomes, you can't do that because they're not founder mutations, and you have a whole diversity and a spectrum of mutations that are explaining breast cancer in these women. Then we asked, do these women have a strong family history? Were they diagnosed? You know, we wanted, we were always looking for a shortcut way to actually find the ones who have mutations. So the, in the literature, it was described that early onset breast cancer. So we said, OK, let's only sequence women who had breast cancer under the age of 40. And then we got an answer. But then now that we can do next generation sequencing, we said, why limit it to women under 40? Just sequence everybody. And when we sequenced everybody, what we found was that, yes, whether they were young or old, we found people with mutations, right? So under 45, about 
uh, of the patients with mutations. And uh, over 50, uh, uh, 45, you still had uh, mutations uh, identified in these individuals. Most people didn't report that they had a family history. However, if you had a family history, 20, uh, nearly 22% had a deleterious mutation versus if they didn't report any mutations. And these are, you know, uh, cases and controls, and we're continuing to actually uh, do this work so that we can really do population estimates of these rare deleterious alleles in, as a way to look at who should be uh, screened and who should have access to genetic testing. Because if we wanted to use the rules that we used in America to, uh, to tell people to go and have genetic testing, majority of the individuals who didn't have a family history would not show up and would not qualify for genetic testing. So this then tells me that, in fact, there are individuals among women in the African diaspora, and I'm, I can go on and on uh, about studies in Bahamas, looking at women who walk through the door, and clearly 25% of them have their breast cancer because they have a founder effect mutation in Bahamas, which is an island. So there's a lot more work that we have to do across the African diaspora to actually estimate the burden of disease that these young women who are getting the most aggressive breast cancers have and where we have no, pop no strategy for cancer control in these populations, whether they're living in the US or they're living in their home countries. Now, let's uh, look at tumors and the cancer genome uh, uh, atlas. The cancer genome atlas, for those of you who are not cancer genomicists, this is one of the best things that's happened uh, where we use sequestration money, uh, or money during the, uh, sequestra during the financial crisis to actually develop large-scale repositories and to do big science. So initially when the, uh, the call was to go and sequence all the tumors, well, it turns out that the tumors that mo were, was available to be sequenced were mostly tumors from white women. And they had to do an extended call to get tumors from black women to be part of TCGA. So uh, while there's been a lot of publication about TCGA and, you know, and, the, and the genomic landscape of tumor in TCGA, we're now just beginning to analyze data in women of African ancestry. And so we happened to uh, lead that analytic uh, analysis. And what's really very important, and this is actually for my good friends, because anytime we, dis we discuss culture and, and race and identity, the question is, should you use genomic race to do your analysis, or should you do self-reported race to determine you know, what it is that you are? And so in TCGA, there were people who reported that they were black, they were white, and um, they were Asian, Caucasian, and of course, uh, the uh, African ancestry, Yoruba. And you can see if you, when you do principal component analysis that the African ancestry group is really nicely clustered here. And the uh, 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 Asian ancestry, nicely clustered. And then you have the, your Caucasian. But then there are the individuals around here who, uh, you know, depending on how they self-report, they can either say they're black, white, or whatever. But one of the things we wanted to do with TCGA was to actually look at, you know, if you do genomic race uh, and the patient has self-reported as black, so what are they? And so if you look at this, most people who say they're black, whether you do it by genomic or by, uh, by self-report, there was actually a very good concordance. There was very uh, uh, few uh, a misclassification where somebody thought um, they were white, but they actually are black based on their ancestry, or, uh, uh, but there was no one who really thought they were black that turned out to be white when you do both genomic and, and uh, self-report. So the question then is, what is the, is the best approximation when you're trying to figure out whether ancestry matters uh, in terms of the proportion of African ancestry, or whether I just ask the patient, are you black or white? 
right? And then maybe that's the best way to do the answer. And I think there's still a debate in the, in the, uh, uh, in the literature about that. But the thing we really wanted to do was we wanted to know within TCGA, people get different types of breast cancers. The most favorable breast cancer is your luminar A breast cancer, which is estrogen receptor positive and which is treated with hormonal therapy. And then you have Lumina B, which is estrogen receptor positive, but it tends to be a little resistant to hormonal therapy. Then you have HER2 enriched, and then you have basal-like. And you can see that the, the, the reverent, uh, 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 the most favorably treated breast cancer, the more African ancestry you have, uh, the higher the proportion of aggressive breast cancer that you are going to have based on TCGA data, okay? So when we unadjusted African-American women more likely to have basal-like breast cancer, more likely to have HO2 enriched breast cancer, adjusting for age, more likely to be basal, more likely to be HO2, compared to your slow-growing Lumina A breast cancer. No wonder population screening for mammography actually doesn't work, especially if what you do is to have mobile mammographies go to churches, and then these women have to then wait to see who will take the breast tumor out or who will do the biopsy. So this is really hot data. Then we asked, there are some you know, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that have actually come out from GYs of breast cancer, and we wanted to know if those SNPs were genotyped in TCGA, is it possible that there would be a little differences between the individuals who are genomically characterized as African American and those who are Caucasian or other races? And clearly, 46 of the 55 SNPs had different allele frequencies by race. So at the population level, we know that the allele frequencies of every gene that is important is going to differ based on your ancestry. And the diversity across the African diaspora makes it even more challenging. So then we wanted to know, uh, are there some alleles that actually are going to uh, determine subtype? And some of these have now been uh, 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 verified that there are actually some, uh, uh, you know, like the uh, Babam-1 uh, uh, SNP that pre uh, predominantly, depending on the allele that you inherit, you might have ER negative breast cancer versus ER positive breast cancer, okay? So looking at allele frequencies, then we ask the question, is it possible that subtype, so the different types of breast cancer that you get, that it might actually be heritable? Now, the challenge for this analysis is that the number of samples that we have in TCGA to actually do this complex analysis is only about 110 you need a larger data set to be able to really nail down uh, the uh, results. But whether we, when we look at it, what we found is that at least when you compare basal versus lumina A or lumina B versus lumina A, HER2 versus lumina A, there's a very high likelihood that the differences in the uh, different subtypes of breast cancer actually is determined by differences in the kinds of alleles that you have. Right? So again, showing that your personal germline genome determines the type of breast cancer that you have. And I bet it's also going to be the same for all types of cancers. So these are really, and then we ask, you know, how about for estrogen receptor? Is it, is, are there, is it a heritable uh, uh, factor? And you can see that, in fact, based on TCGA data, you're more likely to have less expression of estrogen receptor if you have African ancestry genome versus not. And it's not so compelling for HER2 positive breast cancer. But these are really sort of big data science that is allowing us to get some insight about the biology of breast cancer and how it's distributed across different race ethnicity. So, let me uh, transition to what we have done, trying to actually replicate data that we get from, you know, European ancestry women uh, into our 
uh, African ancestry patient. And so this is, we've now formed a consortium trying to look at, you know, everyone who has a, a, a samples, just give us your samples. And so samples from Barbados, African Americans, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'm showing this just to tell you how challenging it is to actually do research that would be meaningful among women of African ancestry or populations of African ancestry just because the data sets are not there. And because you, it's easier to get European ancestry data sets, we're going to have a lot more knowledge about the diseases that impact those populations before we get any knowledge of minority populations. That's just the way science is. You have an idea, you have the resource to do it, you do the, the experiment, you publish your data, end of story. But the story is actually just beginning because if we're gonna to get to precision medicine, we need to do a lot of things. So this is a very busy slide, but I show it because Every time we try to replicate what others have done in European ancestry because of the linkage, you know, the short LD blocks in African ancestry, we can't do it until we repeat the experiment, we do our own analysis, and then we can trust the data that we have just because these are the, uh, the top index markers in European populations. And when we look for it in a, uh, in a polygenic risk uh, score for our African ancestry, it just didn't do anything. However, when we mapped our own best markers in African ancestry population, then we're beginning to see odds ratios that are actually meaningful. And so that really has uh, informed the kind of work we do, because what we want to do is to now pull all the samples, so this is the uh, African American Breast Cancer Consortium. We called our own African consortium the root, because Africa is really the root of all of genetics. And so uh, in our discovery phase, we had uh, more than 1,500 cases and controls from Nigeria. And then we used the AMBA consortium, which is the breast cancer in uh, a black women's study to replicate some of our findings. So clearly, we're looking for SNPs that predict ER positive versus ER negative. And by doing that, we're beginning to actually identify uh, SNPs that have um, uh, genome-wide significance, that are, are able to um, uh, distinguish uh, women in the population with ER positive breast cancer and ER negative breast cancer. And we are really hoping that by doing this work, we're gonna be able to uh, develop a polygenic risk model for individuals of African ancestry. So let me end by then thinking about the big science that we're all doing, which is really the signatures of mutational processes in human cancer. The most important thing that's happening in oncology now is immunotherapy. The fact that there are all these new antigens that are created and that you can use these new antigens to develop novel therapies, immunotherapy, vaccines. They, they, it's just unbelievable the, how we can, in fact, advance the field. I'm excited about it because the genetic, the epidemiologists have always said that some of the risk factors or some of the genes that actually make you get cancer should also be targetable, right? And so when we're looking at the mutation signature, so everybody is looking at the uh, significantly mutated genes in breast cancer. And some of them, just like uh, ER, PR, they're druggable, and there's a lot of new drug discovery based on this mutational uh, uh, signature. But what I think is actually really exciting is that we're able to do that experiment in a Nigerian cohort as well, right? Because the genome technology is there, and we can ask, if you have ER, PR, and HO2 positive breast cancer, and you walk through the door in Nigeria, do you have P53 mutation? Of course you do. Do you have HO2 amplification? Of course you do. GATA1, all of the genes that we can test for, right? Is it important in your breast cancer? Of course it is. So the question is, if it is, how do we get drugs? How do we get treatments? How do we actually make sure that these patients have their, their tumor personalized. So in the US, the same thing. The women who have been diagnosed in Alabama, in Louisville, wherever they are, what is the mutational signature of their tumors? If we really are serious about 
reducing health disparities, and improving health equity, right? What tools would they have to be able to do this? They, I love the way that the AIDS activists actually taught us what we needed to do in cancer. You know, with funding, everybody went out and we had point of care diagnosis. And now we're talking about the end of HIV AIDS. In oncology, we're just not serious about it yet because we're still only now at in escalating how we treat cancer patients by finding more and more drugable targets that extend life for a few months where women who actually have diseases that can be cured with targeted therapy are not being treated. So we're looking at mutation as signature when you have a, a triple negative breast cancer versus not, and you have P53 mutation, what actually causes that mutation to occur? It's, we, we knew uh, in studies uh, looking at aflatoxin in hepatocellular carcinoma that there's actually a particular a mutation that occurs in P53 because people were exposed to aflatoxin. So for a Nigerian uh, breast cancer study, we're looking at cartages and, uh, and uh, looking at uh, the, 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 the uh, hypermutation that occurs in particular regions of the genome to give us insight into what exposure might actually cause these cancers in this place where the exposure of a woman with breast cancer in Nigeria is gonna be very different from the exposure of a woman with breast cancer in Chicago. What is common among those two and what is different? And would that allow us to begin to understand population genetics and then gene environment interactions? So we're really um, uh, quite excited because when we then put everybody together and we look at if you have triple negative breast cancer, and here's the West African Breast Cancer Study, and we've only done 40 exomes by the time I put this together. We have TCGA black or African American, 22. We had twice as many Nigerians that we've been able to uh, do. And then TCGA, 78, because there's just more triple negative breast cancer in Nigeria, and that's where we went to try and get it. It doesn't matter. You can see their P53, they mutate P53 at about the same rate, right? There's no difference. Why is that the case? However, if you look at other genes, so take this uh, 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 in TCGA, you're gonna find that, that uh, this gene is more highly mutated, and you can see that the, the spectrum of mutations among white women, okay, is different from the spectrum of mutations among black and African American women, whether they're in TCGA or not. These are small numbers, but they're telling us something about how genes uh, interact with the environment. So let me end by saying that there's a lot of things that we need to do to do population stratification. Who has breast cancer that just needs to have routine mammography? Who has hereditary breast cancer? Who, are, who needs genetic risk assessment and needs to have uh, more modern modalities or new modalities to uh, screen them? And so this is what, where we are now, where we're just telling every woman when you're 50 or 40, go and get a mammogram. It doesn't work. We have to do better. Now we're doing genetic risk assessment, and we need to spend money where the money is to get people the care that they need. And I think that at the end of the day, when we don't have just one version of what women should do, we're going to actually be able to get to precision health care and get better outcomes. Uh, there's very exciting work now being done in radio genomics where you can actually uh, classify from the first image that you get whether, uh, 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 you know, the prognosis of, uh, of a tumor. So all of these things really give me hope that we will get to the point where we can have precision management of individuals at the highest risk, and then people who have low risk, maybe they don't have to do much. So a lot of people have heard about Angelina Jolie. I've been doing BRCA1 mutation uh, analysis now since 1997. And she's actually a, not the typical woman who has BRCA1 mutation. Most women all, all over the world are not dying to have their breasts removed. In fact, it's a barrier to having testing done if you tell them the only option is to go and have bilateral mastectomy. Yet. In the US, the only way people know about things is when celebrities talk about them. 
okay? And then they can't really relate to that celebrity because they're not going to have their breasts removed, no matter what. So what we know now from, is that not all women need risk-reducing mastectomies. We know that because we don't have a way to screen ovarian cancer, that we can actually reduce ovarian cancer death rate by having people tested. This is why ob gynees are now all through their practices asking women to get genetic testing. And we have a debate about that. Now we know that women with BRCA mutation actually need to be treated with PARP inhibition. And now a lot of oncologists are doing uh, are testing. Positive trials in ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, and even head and neck cancer. So the challenge we're going to have in oncology now are all these people who get tested because they were dying of cancer. And then their at risk relatives have inherited the same genes. What are we going to do? How are we going to treat them? So precision medicine, I'm all for it. But I think we need to really think about how these individual characteristics can actually be learned. So this is the ad from my hospital. They want you to come in and have you know, a specialized care, genomics, and personalized medicine. But you're only going to come in if you have insurance. right? And then you're only going to come in if you can get into cutting edge research. So how do we do cutting edge research in the places where people actually need it? Right? How do we de develop innovative clinical trials? How do we use genomics for preventative care and treatment? Because certainly what we're doing now isn't working. Okay? Every oncology clinical trial, if you do subset analysis, will tell you that there's black-white differences, that the drugs don't work. Is it does it not work, or is it that it's the wrong medicine for the wrong uh, uh, treatment. So let me uh, end by saying that I've had the privilege of being a physician and a scientist, and it's really allowed me to really have a different perspective of what it is that we're, we're going to. I think we need to really begin to engage in community-based research and network so that we can get to where patients are. We can deliver care where people can actually access them. And we need all sorts of research in, in terms of implementation science. And, uh, and we need to really think about how we do this global uh, cancer research so that we all benefit. Because America is an immigrant country, and people's ancestry does matter. So my lab is very large, but we have a lot of collaborators. The GWAS data, we had to put a consortium together. A lot of people contributed to it. And then, of course, the TCGA data is work of a lot of people. So for team science, um, we need diverse uh, 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 individuals who are engaged. And then we need access to funding and the populations. And NHI, NHGRI can lead the way. And thank you all. So, any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, interesting. Um, so, I have a question. When you um, mentioned African ancestry, um, how much of that applies to the entirety of Africa, given that there's a so much diversity there? And even in the United States, you know, as we grow to become a more diverse nation, people's genetics, you know, people from different ethnic groups intermarry. How do you think that will change the landscape? Yeah, so, so the, the question is, so the analysis we did, we had to sort of say how much African ancestry are we going to really say is, uh, uh, is sort of driving the disease. And we came to, well, if you have 50% ancestry, then we're going to categorize you as African ancestry, whereas with European ancestry, it was clear. So th I think those are the kinds of challenges that we all have to solve as, as scientists. You know, when you do your analysis, are you going to do analysis based on what, right? Is it 1% ancestry that's driving it, or is it just a rare allele? So I think the challenge is really that there's a lot of work for you. You know, I see that there are you know, good statistical geneticists here. And population geneticists, they need to help us because their allele frequencies are different just talking about the US, then if you go to Africa, every tribe has a different allele frequency, right? There's so much different. So to do black and white, it doesn't quite get it. So I hear you. And America is a melting pot. There's going to be much more and more 
um, uh, uh, intermarriages so that the, the, the distinction by color will get sort of morphed. And then the question is, it does it matter? Or, you know, BRCA1 is BRCA1. If you have that disease or if you have that mutation, if you get the drug that targets BRCA1, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white or Asian, it works, right? So that's why I'm thinking that precision medicine will actually get us to know what we're talking about and then match this, uh, disease with the right treatment. Oh. Thank you, Fumi, for such an interesting talk. So you mentioned in your somatic uh, profiling analysis, and so you uh, mentioned that you found uh, the uh, patterns of the driver mutations and uh, vary by race, and so that might be related to the different exposures. And so I just wonder, like, you know, uh, whether you could give us some idea about, you know, what kind of those exposures and how, uh, in, in your analysis, how you can link uh, these uh, somatic alterations with the exposures. Okay, that's your job. <laughs> I'm a doctor. <laughs> but that's the thing, is that when you look at this and you see the pattern that actually varies, then the next question is, what's the exposure? Is it common? And that, I think, is the beauty of global health. The Apobec signature was first discovered, and a lot of the, the, um, the um, uh, uh, Shanghai Breast Cancer Study and the alleles and the different types of breast cancer in Asia may be different from what we're talking about. But I think now we know that we should go and find the exposure because now we have this big, big uh, data showing us that something is smashing the chromosome and causing this mutagenesis. What it is, we haven't had the opportunity to do it before because we always ask people about their reproductive health history, their this and their that. Maybe that's the wrong question that we've been asking. So we have only 110 patients in TCGA. We're not going to be able to use TCGA to answer that question. But boy, I hope we'll get money to go and ask the question in uh, our other cohorts. Right, and in the epidemiology study, I guess, you know, now this is a direction, right? And so we would like to um, uh, actually combine, uh, so integrate the, the, the exposures and the somatic profiles. But then, like, you know, to begin with, and of course, you know, you, you can only do a certain number of the, the patients, like, you know, for the, this genomic analysis, because they're uh, very costly to do. But then, like, you know, to uh, what kind of the exposures, like, in your mind? And so we, because we have to, we, we will collect the, the epi data, right, the risk factor data, but what, what kind of the the, the yeah, so I mean, so the, the important thing is that, so, so, so one of the things we learned from our Nigerian breast cancer study was every time we ask the questions about what we know about re reproductive health mm -hmm. uh, risk, it was always in the opposite direction, right? The women had lots of children mm -hmm. and they breastfeed for, you know, 120 months versus African Americans where the average um, um, number of months of breastfeeding was two months. So they're not obese, they're really very lean and they haven't eaten a lot of hamburgers. So many of the risk factors that we associated with African American here doesn't apply in Nigeria. And that's why every day we're looking at our data and putting different hypotheses. And so what we want to do is an ecological study. What are these women eating? What are they doing and why the breast cancer in a low uh, uh, resource setting? So there's a lot of questions really that are, I think I, I just now ready to be answered because we have the tools to do it. Thank you. Thank you for um, a great talk. I really liked your points about um, healthcare disparities and the fact or the, the challenge of delivering healthcare to those who need it most. And I noticed um, in your data, a lot of your um, samples come from Nigeria, but there's a lot of countries in sub-Saharan Africa with um, very unsophisticated healthcare systems and lots of barriers to care. So I was wondering, like moving forward, what do you see um, as kind of a vision for addressing cancer diagnostic in those areas? Is it collaborations with genetic information from those countries that or is it developing point of care testing that may be applicable yeah. in well, those places? Yeah, actually, my point is about local global. Yeah. There are parts of this country that don't have any sophisticated way to diagnose <laughs> breast cancer. Okay. And we still have to think about how we equitably distribute you know, uh, 
uh, cancer care even in this country. So I'm throwing it, you know, I met with the um, fellows at lunch and I'm throwing it at everybody. We all have to think innovatively. Even for those of us who have big hospitals and all that, it's too expensive for us and we can't afford it. Our patients are going into financial toxicity because they can't afford the drugs that we have worked so hard to deliver to them. So I think that we all have to work on this together and think about the low resource setting and how we can accelerate progress by getting the, the, the studies done quickly and getting point of care diagnosis so that no matter where you are, you have a chance to survive. I mean, that's, it's, that's just how I see it. And the, when we started this, um, you know, delivering her, her two targeted therapy, even in Chicago, Northwest Indiana, there would be still people who managed to come to a clinic and had been seen by their local oncologist. There's a 20% disparities gap between where you're treated and your outcomes just because there are not enough resources. So equity, health equity is a question that we all have to answer and we have to think outside the box about how we all do it together, whether it's in Nigeria or it's here, but we're in this global community and we have to work together across Africa, across Latin America, Asia. I mean, there's just a lot of places that need help, including my neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you for a great talk, and it's actually got my mind exploding about in trying to make a message to the public based on the data you showed today. If 30% of the time a mammography isn't going to show the cancer, yet in such a high percentage of women you're testing who already have breast cancer, they're showing that they have mutations. In your control group, it wasn't very high. I mean, women who don't have breast cancer don't tend to have these mutations especially the age variation. Mm -hmm. So what's the message? Um, if, because I think in our attempts, the Public Health Service to send a message out that for most women, most, whatever that means, not stratified, under a certain age, you don't worry. Over a certain age, you go more often. And what you're saying is the most aggressive cancers are in the young women that may have mutations. So. What's the sound bite that we give to the public, <laughs> yeah. if there is one? Well, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Prevention Task Force actually already gave you the sound bite, but we rejected that as a, as a community. There's no data that mammography helps anybody, right? And when we looked at the data and we looked at it and we massaged it, politically, we couldn't say, don't get mammograms. We said, talk to your doctor and have your doctor recommend when and how you get mammograms. And so now, if the Affordable Care Act and, uh, and a lot of cancer prevention guidelines says for every woman, do risk assessment. The ob gyne have been very aggressive about it. They pushed out information to all ob gynees and said, test everybody. But the geneticists were not ready. We say, oh, there are too many variants of unknown significance. It's too expensive. This is the, and we can't do it. And we have to do the experiments first. And so I don't think we have a public health message other than what the task force has said, which is talk to your doctor. <laughs> and most doctors don't even understand the, the nuances. And most people are so afraid of genetics. And yet, you know, you know your cholesterol level. You know, you know, if you're obese, you know your risk factors. And so in cancer, it's the genetics that we know now. And until we know all the other things that we can measure, it's a hard sell. But I tell, I mean, I, I, my clinic is a cancer risk assessment clinic. And there are many people are embracing that and are trying to help families to know when to go for screening. Uh, Mary Claire King and I have actually come out openly to say, Every woman at 30 should just have a genetic test done. And everybody says, oh, it's too expensive. Well, if the test is $200, I'm sure everybody wants to do it. But if it's $3,600, then we can't do it. So the cost is coming down. And I think at some point, people are going to have the data to know the genotype-phenotype correlation. And people will be able to have access to it. The question is, will it come down enough for everybody and will gen I mean, you know, point of care diagnosis, just like cell phones. That we all use cell phones now in the most re remote 
country, uh, place in Africa, they have cell phones. So hopefully the technology will really drive and the innovation will drive how we move this forward. But it, the time is ripe to actually do it. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> well, you just opened so many more. <laughs> Good. That's the whole point. That's why I'm here. <laughs> that, that was a lovely talk. And, and there's such diversity from each tribe within Africa. You wonder if you're better off to go to a place which has much less diversity. I go back to think about the Japanese migrants when Japanese women had very low rates of uh, breast cancer, but when they come to the United States, their risk goes up over time and with generation. Uh, probably not because their genes are changing. So is that an epigenetic phenomenon? Are there special genes that change or mutate? What's happening there? Yeah, thank you. That's actually the part of my talk that I didn't get to because I've only really laid the framework for genetics. I'm coming back for another talk in October, and then we will talk about the epigenetics. Because in fact, it's only, even if I tell you about, you know, 20, you know one in five or 22% positive for BRCA1. We're finding that, in fact, the regulatory region and the epigenetic changes in these tumors might actually just be related to exposure and to other things that are not based on your, that you were born with a mutation. So the field is exploding, but you don't get epigenetics without your genetics, right? And that's why we really need to do a better job with measuring exposure, measuring population differences, and and then figuring out what exactly should we be measuring. So I think you know, the genomic revolution is giving us new biomarkers. It may be that there will be blood-borne biomarkers that we can look at that would be better predictors than doing DNA analysis. But I think this is what we have now. This is where we are. And the field would advance the more we are able to do these kinds of studies. Hi, fantastic talk. Um, so I like the direction uh, we're going because we're opening a discussion about risk and knowing the differences between risk in people from African descent in America. But we also need to look at more druggable target. So how can we have that conversation where we are looking at other targets and getting targets that p potentially already FDA approved and seeing if we can use some of those already to, to look at the triple negative, like um, EFGR, for example, or maybe I know some of the triple negative have uh, Claudins are involved. So are you looking at some other targets and how can we get that conversation? Because at the end of the day, you want to treat the cancer. Yeah, right? thank you. So, so what we actually found, we, my first experiment at the University of Chicago was to look at our database and to look at women that our surgeons had treated a long time ago, because chemotherapy, was sort of, you know, after the Manhattan Project sort of folded, Leon Goldberg was an oncologist that was really treating uh, leukemia patients and cancer patients with chemotherapy. And if you didn't even get any new drug to the market, but you treated everyone with triple negative breast cancer with chemotherapy, and you treated them, that woman I showed you with a small triple negative breast cancer, she got neoadjuvant chemotherapy, her tumor disappeared. And when you have uh, pathologic complete remission with uh, triple negative breast cancer, it never recurs. It's just if, you know, 50% of them don't recur. So the issue is that drugs that work, even for triple negative breast cancer. The problem is most of it occurs when it's already too advanced for us to actually use effective therapies. If that woman had been on the south side of Chicago and she felt a lump, the time it would take her to get to me or to get to anybody to treat her will probably be another six months to a year. And the thing is, these tumors have a high proliferation rate, and they double, right? They're not slow growing. So what happens is the mutation burden then increases. The tumors are, are beginning to mutate and have different changes, and then they become resistant to therapy. So I think that implementation science means what we know works now, let's do it. Right? And let's not wait for a perfect situation to start implementing what we know works. So if we can use chemotherapy, use it well, support women in their communities, a lot of women with triple negative breast cancer will be cured of their breast cancer. And those that are not cured, they should be part of a research to find new therapies. And there are certainly new therapies, immunotherapy, vaccines. 
There's just a lot we can do, but we need to organize ourselves where women, wherever they live, can have access. Because not every woman can come to the University of Chicago or come to the NIH. So how do we equitably distribute resources in communities so people can get care? On that note? Yeah. Thank you.